Australia is plagued by scandals involving police raids on journalists' homes and offices, as well as the prosecution of whistleblowers for revealing Australian spying on a former president of East Timor. We'll be hearing a talk by Australian journalist Quentin Dempster, as well as a message to Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison from Julian Assange's father. Welcome to Politics in the Pub. Uh, all of us who uh, hopefully watched Four Corners on Monday evening about Bernard Calarian Witness K and the um, well-practiced deceit of the Australian government. Now, this evening is also highly related to what we discussed in that dramatic meeting three weeks ago concerning the, our responsibility to bring Julian Assange home. And before I introduce Quentin, I want to ask John Shipton, Julian's father, to uh, come forward and read a letter that I gather was uh, recently written to the Prime Minister. John. Julian's brother, Gabriel, went to uh, Belmar's prison just a few weeks ago, and this is the letter as a result of that that he wrote to uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison. He goes, uh, Dear the Honourable Scott Morrison, on Tuesday the 6th of August, I went to visit my brother Julian in Belmarsh Prison. It's been a year since I'd seen him last. I hugged him and said it was good to see him. He replied it was good to see me too and that this place is hell. In an instant I understood what he meant. A yellow inmate's band wound tightly around his arm, exposed how emaciated he'd become underneath his baggy prison clothes. In his eyes and voice were the signs that this hell was working hardest at crushing any hope he had left. I sat in the visiting room surrounded by the highest security prisoners in Britain and watched my brother eat a sandwich. We didn't laugh this time, there was nothing to laugh about. I held back tears as I realised I might never see him again. I beg you, Prime Minister, to help save my brother Julian Assange's life. Yours sincerely, Gabriel. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Well, as I hinted earlier, the whole issue of um, uh, the protection of publishers, journalists, whistleblowers is uh, concerns not only Julian, but in particular Julian, but also the, the topic tonight, which is about police raids on the ABC, the responsibility to protect uh, journalists and whistleblowers, and indeed to support uh, the, the ABC. When you think of that topic, um, it wasn't very difficult to decide who to invite to speak to it. Uh, Quentin Dempster, is a very experienced journalist. He's won Walkley Awards. He's been given the Order of Australia for to services to journalism. He's written books about people who stand up to corruption and who uh, suffer the consequences of having the courage to stand up to corruption. Um, in addition to that, Quentin has this rare skill of speaking truth to power and being absolutely explicit in his criticism of bullies and corrupt operators, but somehow in a way that still manages to not completely alienate himself from him. I'm not very good at that, so congratulations in that respect, Quentin. Uh, please welcome Quentin to the microphone. Uh, thanks, Stuart. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I acknowledge we meet on Aboriginal land, always was, always will be. Thank God for Annika Smithhurst's underwear drawer. That's all I can say. <laughs> Never in the history of Australia's battered democracy has the secret state and its understandably paranoid intelligence agencies been exposed by the undergarments of a Murdoch reptile. <laughs> when the AFP subjected Annika to a seven hour search warrant raid of her Canberra home, including rifling through her cookbooks and her underwear drawer, it managed to unite this country's rivalrous media. Well done, yeah. AFP. Yeah. <laughs> Rupert Murdoch, who once wouldn't hesitate to sue his dirt diggers 
onto your garbage bins and voicemails to get a bit of commercially exploited, exploitable voyeur, voyeuristic tittle-tattle for his ranting rags was reportedly affronted by the invasion of Annika's privacy. His Nukes Corps Australasia chairman Michael Miller soon joined with the ABC's new managing director David Anderson and Nine's now all-powerful CEO Hugh Marks to take a brave stand for freedom of the press. Thanks to the AFP for this fortunate timing of their raids following references from the Australian Signals Directorate in the first Smethurst raid and Australian Security Intelligence Service, ASIS, in the case of the second search warrant raid of the ABC over what's known as the Afghan files. News Corp solidarity can't always be relied upon. <laughs> its organs bagged the ABC mercilessly after the ABC and Guardian Australia reported Edward Snowden's drop of NSA Five Eyes intelligence that the ASD had been bugging the mobile telephones of Indonesia's then President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, his wife and senior Indonesian ministers. Picking up the theme, News Corp's then favourite Prime Minister Tony Abbott piled on, accusing the ABC of not playing for Australia. But now, when News Corp's operatives are invaded, we're all in this together. Thank you, Rupert. I'm hoping for an invitation to speak on press freedom at the Paul Ramsey Centre for Western Civilization. <laughs> and now, but now, watch the politicians and the security agencies play the Australian media like a trout. The terms of reference written by Attorney General Christian Porter for the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security are designed to take the heat and steam out of public outrage over the raids, and simply for Annika Smithhurst. Everyone gets to make a submission about their experiences. Terms of reference C, quote, whether any, and if so what, changes could be made to procedures and thresholds for the exercise of those law enforcement powers in relation to journalists and media organisations to better balance the need for press freedom with the need for law enforcement and intelligence agencies to investigate serious offending and obtain intelligence on security threats." Close quotes. So the media is being asked to address the concept of contested hearings in relation to search warrants in future. Contested hearing to be called to a court and have a de this debate about what the security agencies want. So please don't raid us. We'll hand over our USB sticks voluntarily and negotiate with you on what we can and cannot publish. The media is being asked to condone law enforcement and intelligence agencies having access to electronic data on devices used by journalists and media organisations. This is meant to be collaborative and negotiable. Big mistake, I think, if the media falls into that. That's not press freedom. That's a derivative of the old wartime D-notice system where all Australian media editors, including the ABC, agreed not to publish material deemed by the D-notice committee to be vital to national security. There was no, no statutory requirement. It was, a, 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 if you like, a gentleman's agreement. In the 1990s, the ABC blotted its D-notice copybook when foreign correspondent reported that we'd wired the new Chinese embassy with listening devices as it was under construction in leafy Canberra. It was a big embarrassment at the time for Australia, the ABC, and for China. The D-notice system was said to be under review. It hadn't met since 1982. <laughs> but we're not at war, ladies and gentlemen, now, are we? We're not at war now, are we? <laughs> Nowhere in the terms of reference of the current parliamentary committee is there a call for submissions on the need for all intelligence and security agencies to embark on a new culture of transparency to honestly and intelligently engage the people of Australia with their important work. Nowhere in the terms of reference is there a call for submissions for whistleblowers within security and intelligence agencies to be genuinely protected when they have the integrity to formally but internally raise their concerns about criminality, illegality, malfeasance, blundering or incompetence. Some officials believe that when you sign up for employment with a high or low level security clearance, you are contracted to keep the agency's secrets no matter what the blunder or illegality you may have witnessed. 
Now, Andrew Wilkins said at a forum today that uh, there's uh, protected disclosures legislation. Thank heavens that there is there. That's for public administration. But particularly, the protected disclosures don't apply to the employees of security agencies and, um, and intelligence agencies. I experienced corporate... I want you to consider this. I experienced corporate or bureaucratic anger at whistleblowing in the ABC in the 1990s when a brave whistleblower exposed what was called backdoor commercial sponsorship of ABC infotainment programs. He'd used what was in the rules, the upward referral rule, confidentially and internally. This is a concern to the, my entity. I must raise this matter. Raised it internally and confidentially to draw attention to breaches of the ABC Act and editorial policies, which prohibited commercial influence on program content. The viewers, the audience, had to trust the content that the ABC was presenting that wasn't influenced by commercial advantage. So, but rather than being praised for his integrity, he was vilified, sidelined and moved close up to the exit door. Upward referral was soon rendered to be in practice downwardly destroy those who upwardly refer. <laughs> Whistleblowers Australia confirms this phenomenon. They've got many people who come to them for legal and moral and uh, uh, empath empathetic advice. Whistleblowers Australia confirms this phenomenon within Commonwealth, state, public and private sector organisational culture and hierarchy. Many whistleblowers find themselves on the outer immediately they lodge their concerns with their superiors. And soon the whistleblower is counselled, moved out of the workplace, isolated, alienated and then often traumatised to the point of psychological incapacity requiring medical discharge. The whistleblower is out, the problem is covered up. Whistleblowers Australia has identified this as a phenomenon. This is something that the parliament of anybody of goodwill has to address. How do we get legitimate pathways? If you've got to keep the organisation secrets, how do we get pathways so that you can raise concerns without destroying your career? And journalists deal with this all the time uh, in dealing with uh, their informants, some of whom uh, are, are misguided, some of whom don't know the risks, and you have to counsel them and say, look, do you really want to do this? This, was, this is the end of your working life. You, no one will employ you after this. You really want to do this. So you have to be very careful. And this, in, in, as far as organisational culture, this has to be addressed about how you protect the people who are at least trying to get the organisation for which they work to act with some integrity and move on evidence that is, that is presented. No wonder most whistleblowers, the ones who are angered or embittered or whatever, go straight to the media, or, or acting just out of conscience and integrity, go straight to the media and take their chances with prosecution. <coughs> I think that may well be the case in one of those cases that's before the courts at the moment. We need to think again about why whistleblowing is important to competent public and private organisational integrity. Not this rejection of the whistleblower, rather than if your chief executive say, thanks for raising that with me. Thanks, Stuart, for raising that with me. I'll take it up straight away. Rather than close the door and say, how can we get rid of this bastard? You see, that's... Lots that's, of people have asked that question. That is the, that is the immediate... Not you, Stuart. I'm sure there'll be no move against you. Uh, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the cultural difficulty in organisational hierarchy. But it, look, the, the book's written about this sort of stuff. So we need to think again about why whistleblowing is important to competent public and private organisational integrity. In terms of national security, it is more important than ever. Just ask Andrew Wilkie, the courageous Australian intelligence analyst who resigned rather than be part of the coalition of the willing's fabricated justification for the invasion of Iraq in 2004. Now proved to be a lethal folly, tragically akin to the war in Vietnam. I'm asking all the security agency people who, who think about this to think about the advice that they, uh, they give to government. I'll, I'll go into that a, a, little short, uh, a, a little more shortly. To drive home the point about transparency, I need here to repeat the deathbed confession of Robert McNamara, the US Secretary of Defence, who Time magazine asserted had delivered one of the ten greatest apologies of all time. We were wrong terribly wrong on Vietnam, said Robert McNamara. We owe it to future generations to explain why. There's a wonderful documentary called The Fog of War. This is a, a wonderful 
um, uh, explication of mindsets in intelligence agencies and uh, national security motivations for, for lethal events. Uh, McNamara writing in his 1995 memoir in retrospect on the management of the Vietnam War. The Nixon administration used its plumbers, the Dirty Tricks Squad, to raid the psychiatrist's office of analyst Daniel Ellsberg, who had given the Pentagon Papers, which proved the folly of Vietnam, to the New York Times and the Washington Post. Ladies and gentlemen, secrecy, it can mislead the polity. Secrecy, it can kill our young soldiers, sailors, sailors. Secrecy can kill our young soldiers, sailors and airmen and women and countless other innocent people. Secrecy is the problem. Now, in 2019, it seems we've learned nothing from the apology of Robert McNamara or the persecution of Daniel Ellsberg and contemporaneously, the persecution of WikiLeaks' uh, Julian Assange, the NSA's Edward Snowden, or the attempted discrediting of Australia's Andrew Wilkie, the prosecution of uh, ASA, ASIS's Witness K and Bernard Caleri, the ATO whistleblower Richard Boyle, or the Australian Defence Forces Afghan Files whistleblower David McBride. In this era of lone wolf and copycat terror, of warmongering and sabre rattling as the United States builds up fear of a Chinese invasion, and not just from full fee paying students at our universities, <laughs> where the defence analyst Hugh White says Australia must consider having submarines equipped with missiles with nuclear warheads to protect ourselves from China, we need to pause and think again about what we are doing and why. I'm just asking, how much do nuclear warheads cost? <laughs> Don't we need to mitigate climate change first? Don't we? Yeah, yeah. Just asking. Can we, make, can we make nuclear warheads in South Australia? <laughs> or do we have to import them from the United States? Wouldn't the possession of nuclear weapons make Australia a certified target for nuclear attack? Won't diversion of taxpayer funds to our nuclear capability mean much less for education, health and infrastructure for our congested cities? Big question I want you to consider. And, and it's something that all journalists, uh, and I'm sure all, all, everybody in the world is looking at now with the, the struggle of the, of the people of Hong Kong. Will China's President Xi Jinping order the People's Liberation Army into Hong Kong to crush the pro-democracy protest movement? Or will he leave? Will he, will he leave it to the locals to root out the dissident leaders over time and or just wait patiently until one country, two systems expires in 2047? Somebody said he's moved in today? The army has moved into Hong Kong, you say? Is it, what's the source for that? We'll see what happens. China may not have a free press. China does not have a free press. But we here in Australia need to demonstrate to the Chinese Communist Party Politburo that we can handle the truth through the clash of ideas facilitated by a free press, robust and transparent public and corporate governance, what we call in a functioning democracy the separation of powers, an independent judiciary, fair electoral boundaries and an accountable executive government through our representative parliaments. In this era of President Donald Trump's Twitter brinkmanship with North Korea's Kim Jong-un and Iran's President Hassan Rouhani and Australia's usual symbolic support for the US with our frigate deployed in the Straits of Hormuz, we need smarter, more competent intelligence agencies capable now of building trust with Australian taxpayers. We need intellectually honest engagement with the public, not the criminalising of journalists and the persecution of whistleblowers and media informants. The US pursuit of Australian citizen Julian Assange, now facing UK Boris Johnson supported extradition and incarceration for life in a US prison. The 2013 courageous action of NSA contractor Edward Snowden in alerting the world to NSA breaches of the US Constitution through illegal mass surveillance 
has actually deepened the paranoia of security and intelligence agencies. It hasn't changed their thinking to one of engagement with people they say they are trying to defend and protect. Apparently it's a big deal for them to be able to show the world, particularly their foreign intelligence agency rivals trying to hack into our systems, that they have the determination to keep their own secrets. This is madness. When I mentioned earlier the understandable paranoia of our home affairs, security and intelligence agencies, I was trying to keep in fair perspective the heavy burden on them to keep us safe given the global fear now being escalated by constituent politicians along with the xenophobia and nationalism being provoked by trade wars and dog whistle racism by constituent politicians going on all over the world. With random and copycat terror, where and when someone can drive a youth into a crowded street where the white supremacist Christchurch shooter, unobserved, unidentified by security agencies, can arm himself with semi-automatic rivals and massacre worshippers in that city's mosque, there is an impossible pressure on our domestic security and counter-terrorism agencies. There's not a hope that they can keep us safe under these totally random circumstances. I'd simply hate to be Duncan Lewis, and I asked you to think about this, I'd simply hate to be Duncan Lewis, head of ASIO. Why didn't he and ASIO know about the threats from these people? That's what the politician, the Prime Minister said, Duncan, why didn't we know about this? Where, where, what's our security? What? He has to give an explanation to the, to the ministers who are elected, as ScoMo says, uh, and are accountable to the people. Duncan Lewis and all these security agencies have to front up. The AFP have to front up. Where's our counter-terrorism? Why didn't we know about this guy? If I was Dun Duncan Lewis, I want you to understand this. If I was Duncan Lewis, I'd want real-time access to everyone's mobile phones and browsing history to act immediately on any tip-off. You'd want that, wouldn't you? How can individual privacy be a barrier to public safety, he would ask. And they do ask that. No wonder our politicians have agreed to demands by security agencies for more than 70 security laws, including instantaneous warrantless access to metadata, telephony and everyone's digital footprint. No wonder that's been waved through by the Parliament, given the fear that exists in our community. No wonder we're now developing interoperability in facial and vehicle recognition technology with CCTV monitoring of the streets and byways of Australia. How can the luxury of individual privacy be a barrier to public safety? We have to answer that question. We can understand the pressure the era, era of terror, xenophobia and fear imposes on all our law enforcement and security guardians. But for that very reason, these same agencies need to be much more transparent about what they're doing and why. They want us to phone a 1-800 number if we reasonably suspect anyone of malign intent. The public will help keep us safe. If you engage the public, the public will help, is my experience. But to build trust, we need more exposure and debate about the, the laws which are supposed to govern their operations and the reasons that our privacy can be so easily taken away, but with measures in place to safeguard it. Now, next week, our old mate, uh, Brian Tui, will publish his next book, Secret, The Making of Australia's Security State, Melbourne University Press. I think it was one of uh, Louise Adler's last, last commission, and Brian's been working on it for years. Uh, I've been reading an embargoed copy and will honour that embargo by not revealing its fresh insights and exposures of the full panoply of security and intelligence misjudgments, blunders and incompetence over the post-World War I and World War II period. 360 pages, I think. But as you'd expect, with full footnotes and references, but as you'd expect, Brian lays it all out. He despairs about the unhealthy paranoia which drives the secret state, with the US, China, Russia, the UK, France, India, Pakistan and Israel and others armed to the teeth with nuclear missiles with an ever-present risk of error, escalation or misjudgment. It's a great book, particularly from an Australian perspective. I, <laughs> Can you uh, water, please, uh, Stuart? Um, it's a great book, particularly from an Australian perspective. I hope it helps Andrew Hastie and members of the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Security and Intelligence think much more seriously and deeply about press freedom and the need for transparency in exactly what the security and intelligence agencies are doing to keep us safe. 
Finally, I also draw your attention to Bernard Caleri's portentous remark at the end of Steve Kinane and Peter Cronow's ABC Four Corners report on Monday night about the Timor-Leste raids on that cabinet office in Dili. Remember? What does Mr Caleri mean when he says that when all this unpleasantness, his prosecution, is over, he will have something more to say and that there's a boomerang phenomenon developing in this distressing and vicious overreach by the Commonwealth Government. Well, one indicator, one indicator could be contained in what Professor Clinton Fernandes wrote in Crikey.com on Wednesday this week. He says, Four Corners left out another important aspect. He's going on, now what was left on the cutting room floor? The use of ACES for commercial purposes was just one element of a much larger use of state assets for corporate wealth. I'm quoting here, from 1970 onwards, what is now the government agency Geoscience Australia conducted scientific surveys of Australia's undersea geology and then handed over this publicly funded information to petroleum companies for almost nothing. In 1988, Treasury, with the support of the Department of Finance, objected to such, a valuable information, to such valuable information being given away to private interests, urging a much more substantial level of cost recovery. But the Department of Foreign Affairs insisted the national interest required taxpayers, funds, the taxpayers fund the costs and, crucially, the risks of investment in fundamental research, while the corporate sector benefited from the energy riches in the continental shelf. Still quoting, on September 4, 1984, West Australian Premier Brian Burke formally opened the $27 billion North West Shelf gas project, which was operated by a then little-known company called Woodside Petroleum. It began exporting liquefied natural gas, LNG, in 1989. The project has today become one of the largest LNG producers in the world and Woodside has become Australia's largest state standalone oil and gas company and one of the top 20 stocks in the ASX by market capitalisation. The Australian government has seemingly deployed the full weight, this is according to Professor Fernandes, deployed the full weight of its diplomatic, legal and scientific assets over decades to secure massive benefits for Woodside's shareholders. In return, according to Woodside's own calculations, in February 2017, Governments have received approximately $26 billion in royalties, excise and taxes from the North West Shelf projects since it began in 1984. Other governments have taken a different approach, he says. The Norwegian government is the largest shareholder in Statoil, its state oil company. Statoil's workers elect several of the company's directors and its shareholders' meetings are open to the public, as are its financial statements. The Norwegian government created the Olgi Fonde, or oil fund in 1990 to invest Norway's oil reserve revenue. The fund had US $1 trillion, more than, more than uh, 1.2 trillion Australian dollars in December 2017. In Australia, he says, the national interest has instead amounted to the socialisation of costs and risks and the privatisation of profits with taxpayers getting a trickle of revenue in return. Now, Clinton Fernandes, is a professor of international and political studies at the University of New South Wales, Canberra, and author of Islands, Island Off the Coast of Asia, Instruments of Statecraft in Australian Foreign Policy. I haven't got that book yet, but I'm going to get it. Now, that's a very serious allegation from Professor Fernandez. If this is true, the Australian public are being robbed. 100%. Our intelligence, security, and more disturbingly, our intelligence, security, and government agencies he alleges, are being misused for shareholder benefit, not public benefit. Maybe that's what Bernard Colliery means when he says this will boomerang on the government. I think we need another Four Corners investigation into this allegation, particularly when the bugging of the Timor-Leste embassy is a clear evidentiary lead into what looks like a more systemic problem. This is to be a test of the media's resolve to expose the truth the Federal Parliament's obligation to call executive government to account, if necessary, including the security agencies, that may point again to the need for another judicial inquiry or royal commission. And ultimately, before we go to war with China, in answer to an executive order from Xi Jinping to withdraw all Chinese students from our universities, 
I want to share Robert McNamara's 11 lessons from the folly of Australia, US and New Zealand's involvement in the war in Vietnam. Well over a million North and South Vietnamese Cambodians were killed, 58,000 US military personnel and support staff were killed, more than 500 Australians and New Zealanders and other foreign nationals were killed. A tragedy, a folly, a monumental misjudgment over what is called national security. Please also apply this line of thinking to any of our current suspected or perceived enemies. This is Robert Mar McNamara's uh, In Retrospect, taken from his book In Retrospect, The Tragedy and Lessons of Vietnam. Lesson one, we misjudged them and we have since the geopolitical intentions of our adversaries and we exaggerated the dangers to the United States of their actions. We viewed the people and leaders of Vietnam in terms of our own experience. We totally misjudged the political forces within the country. We underestimated the power of nationalism to motivate the people to fight and die for beliefs and values. Our misjudgments of friend and foe alike reflected our profound ignorance of the history, culture and politics of the people in the area and the personalities and habits of their leaders. We failed then and have since to recognise the limitations of modern, high-technology military equipment, forces and doctrine. We failed as well to adapt our military tactics to the task of winning the hearts and minds of people from a totally different culture. We failed to draw Congress and the American people into a full and frank discussion and debate of the pros and cons of a large-scale military involvement before we initiated the action. After the action got underway and unanticipated events forced us off our planned course, we did not fully explain what was happening and why we were doing what we did. We did not recognise that neither our people nor our leaders are omniscient. Our judgement of what is in another people or country's best interests should be put to the test of open discussion in international forums. We do not have the God-given right to shape every nation in our image or as we choose. We did not hold to the principle that US military action should be carried out only in conjunction with multinational forces supported fully and not merely cosmetically by the international community. We failed to recognise that in international affairs as in other aspects of life, there may be problems for which there are no immediate solutions. At times, we may have to live with an imperfect, untidy world. Underlying many of these errors lay our failure to organise the top echelons of the executive branch to deal effectively with the extraordinarily complex range of political and military issues. Thank you, Robert McNamara. Anyone but an ignorant redneck would weep as they read these tragic lessons from the folly of Vietnam. I'm hoping for a similar confession, apology and lessons learned from George Bush, Tony Blair, and John Howard for the folly of Iraq. And finally, when it comes to a free press and journalism operating within a functioning democracy where the rule of law applied by an independent judiciary hopefully still applies, I draw your attention to US District Court Judge Murray Gerfine, who rejected the Nixon administration's request for an injunction restraining the New York Times from the publication of Daniel Ellsberg's leaked Pentagon papers. Judge Gerfine's ruling was later confirmed by a majority on the US Supreme Court. Judge Gerfine wrote, the security of the nation is not at the ramparts alone. Security also lies in the value of our free institutions. A cantankerous press, an obstinate press, a ubiquitous press must be suffered by those in authority in order to preserve the even greater values of freedom of expression and the right of the people to know. And to Annika Smithhurst, thanks for enduring the official violation of your underwear drawer. <laughs>